Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's. If we can serve you in any way, please don't hesitate to make it known to us. Um, a couple of announcements. Don't forget we will have coffee and conversation in um, the fireside room after the church, so please join us there. Another reminder, don't forget, next Sunday is daylight savings time change, so the clocks go back an hour. I like to think of it as we get that hour back that they stole from us. Um, today, Reformation Sunday, the paramounts, the paramounts on the altar and pulpit are red. Red is the color of the Holy Spirit, which came upon the heads of the apostles on the first Pentecost Sunday as tongues of fire. Red reminds us that the Holy Spirit is continually with the church, reforming it and renewing it, not just at certain times and in certain places, as the Spirit did 500 years ago in Germany, but always and everywhere. Indeed, the Spirit seeks to reform and renew each one of us. We only need to be open to the Spirit's promptings. Concerning this day, rooted in the past and growing into the future, the church must always be reformed in order to live out the love of Christ in an ever-changing world. We celebrate the good news of God's grace that Jesus Christ sets us free every day to do this life-transforming work. Trusting in the freedom given to us in baptism, we pray for the church that Christians will unite more fully in worship and mission. This week, we are again pleased to have with us Pastor Emmert as our preacher. Welcome, Pastor Emmert.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may be in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the 
Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word, protect in them in times of trial, defend them against all enemies of the gospel, and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. first reading this morning is from Jeremiah. The renewed covenant will not be breakable, but like the old covenant, it will expect the people to live upright lives. To know the Lord means that one will defend the cause of the poor and needy. Jeremiah 22, 16. The renewed covenant is possible only because the Lord will forgive iniquity. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your responses are requested for Psalm 46. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold.
Our second lesson this morning is from Romans. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. A reading from Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By what of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Be with God. According to St. John, chapter 8. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. My name is Katerina von Bora Luther. 
You probably know me as Katie Luther. When I was five, my mother passed away and my father could not care for us, so he took me to the convent for them to raise and care for me. And as part of that, at the age of five, I made vows to spend my life serving God. Well, as I grew, it didn't sit so well anymore. How many of you could keep promises that you made when you were five? When you're five, forever is 10 seconds, right? To serve God, well, that's a good thing. But living in the convent was not necessarily what I meant by serving God. And so things didn't exactly go the way I might have expected. Oh, people told me that the most holy people are the ones that live in the monasteries and the convents and devote their lives to serving God. But somehow, it didn't feel so much that way to me when we bickered and fought. Because, as you can imagine, you put 20 or 50 people together in the same place and they live together all the time. <laughs> we don't always see Christ in each other's eyes. I wondered and dreamed what it would be like to live in the real world. And then I heard about this man, Martin Luther, who said that we're not required to keep promises we made as five-year-olds. That it's not a sin to break a vow that was made when we were five. I wanted to meet this man. He said all sorts of other strange things too. He said that holy people could be married because marriage was a holy devotion. That being married was like Christ and the church. And that our work as spouses was God's work as well. Well, I wrote to him and said, you know, there are, well, first I talked to some of the sisters, not all of them. We had to be most careful because uh, there were many different views within the community. But some of the sisters and I truly wanted to leave the convent. But we weren't even allowed to go outside to go to the market. So I wrote to Dr. Luger and I said, Herr Doctor, would you please help us to escape from the, from the convent? We would like to live in the world as citizens of the world and serve God in a new way. Well, he had a friend who delivered herring to the convent weekly, so we would have our, our fish to eat. And so we made arrangements of one day when he delivered the fish, he had a delivery back to Dr. Luger. A bunch of nuns who uh, I would say probably did not smell the best when we arrived. But Dr. Luder made arrangements for us to all get cleaned up and some of the uh, women went back to live with their families and some found positions as governesses, which I did for a while, and some found spouses to marry. But I was a problem. I was always a problem to someone. There were suitors, but none that I found suitable. I had my eye on Dr. Luder himself. Now I was 25 or so, and he was 45 or so. But he was wise and kind 
and helped us to see a new way of being. And I was headstrong and decided I wanted only the best for myself. If I was going to live this new life, I was going to live it fully as the bride of Dr. Luder. And so as they arranged some suitors for me, somehow they never quite worked out. Now, Dr. Luger had been saying that it was okay for holy people to be married, for priests to marry. But he hadn't really thought about that for himself. <laughs> Until I told him. <laughs> and finally, he gave up. <laughs> he said, I don't know what this thing is to have this woman in pigtails lying in the bed beside me. But I think he was happy. I know that I was. And we had a full and busy life. We had six children, four of whom lived into adulthood. Quite an accomplishment in my day. We didn't talk about the two who didn't make it. We lived through the Peasants' Revolt, and in fact, I had to leave for a while for safety. And we lived through, hmm, you'll understand this one, we lived through the plague and had times when we had to isolate to protect ourselves. In times, I went about from house to house nursing those who were ill. You see, besides having children, we also lived in um, basically an inn that was owned by the university. So Dr. Luter, of course, was busy teaching and some of the students had nowhere to stay, so they stayed with us. And so we had a boarding house. And you never heard such lively dinner discussion as with Dr. Luder and a bunch of students. It was fun to just quietly listen in between my work. Now, I didn't do all this alone. I mean, after all, we had a fishing pond and an orchard and animals and to tend and a great deal to take care of. So I had a manservant and a maidservant and it was my responsibility to supervise them. And it wasn't cheap to be able to do all of this. Dr. Luger was supported by, um, by the local prince but I had to regularly nudge him to ask for an increase in his assistance so that we could afford to provide for the students and our growing family to, to um, have a source for food in the farm and so on. As Dr. Luder aged, he began to think about his will. And he decided that uh, he would give guardianship to me. Now this was never done. A guardian needed to be a man who could handle the property decisions and everything that's necessary for the care of children. But Dr. Luder would have none of it. He said, who would work harder to provide for the care of children than their mother. And so he insisted on that, perhaps to his regret, because as he sought uh, a trustee for the will, one friend after another said, I can't work with Katie Luder. Well, I don't know. Maybe being headstrong can be a problem, but I think it also served as well. So I mentioned listening to the table talks. 
Dr. Luder told us something remarkable. You see, we had learned from the day we were born that if we were not in a state of grace when we died, we would go straight to hell. A state of grace meant that we had confessed every sin that we had done, every sin of omission, everything that we had not done that we should have. And uh, confess those to the priest and receive absolution and communion. And you know, if you're struck by lightning, you're probably not in a state of grace at that moment. Dr. Luther especially lived in fear that, that he would die at an unexpected moment and be not in a state of grace. And so he went to his priest daily and spent three hours a day confessing his sins until finally his confessor said to him, Martin, go away and don't come back until you've actually done something. <laughs> when he became a professor, he was an Old Testament professor, but you know, he was the new guy, so they asked him to teach the class on Romans. They needed a professor for that. And so he started studying Romans deeply in a way he never had before. And he came across the passage that we heard today, uh, Romans 3, which includes, For all have sinned and fallen short before the glory of God. So what hope is there for any of us? But he continued on until he got to Romans 8, where it promises that God seeks a different kind of rule. Not the rule that you must be doing everything perfectly and one wrong step will get you thrown into hell but the one that says we're not measured by the worst thing we do in our life, but by the best things we do in our lives. And we're not even measured by the best things we do in our lives. We're measured by the love of God. And he began to teach about grace, about God's plan for the world. It's a plan of forgiveness. A plan that instead of excluding people and condemning them, invites and welcomes. He could even find room for me in his household and find joy in that. A recalcitrant nun. Dr. Luther spent three hours a day in prayer, and so I worked very hard to make sure he was protected. And sometimes I would hear a thump as he threw the Bible at the devil that was threatening him. He said that if things were going well, he could pray three hours a day, but if they were going badly and he was rushing about, he needed extra time in prayer. And so he spent much time in his room in prayer. You see, he understood that the most precious time in life is to be in the presence of God. The most precious time in life is to be with the one who says, I love you beyond all meaning. And I have a better plan than punishment for sins. I will send my son, my own flesh and blood, so to speak, into the world to accept the penalty for all of our sins through all of history, to advocate before the judgment seat, to say, oh no, this one's sins are paid. This one is your precious child and is welcome. 
What an odd plan, no? God has a funny way of doing things. Five-year-old nuns turned into wives of heretics. See, even when I met Dr. Luther, the Pope had declared that anyone who killed him would not be sinning. God has a funny way of doing things. That's inviting us into his presence. And boy, am I thankful that God does things like that. Aren't you? Well, I thank you for allowing me to come through time and space from Germany in the late 1400s, well, early 1500s to today, um, to have this time with you. It's been a pleasure. It's such an amazing time and place, things that I could never imagine in my time. You have the gifts of princes and princesses. And please know that that's what you are. You are children of the king, princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. What a funny God we have. Thanks be to God. We'll sing hymn number 229, A Mighty Fortress.
stand in body or in spirit, and let us confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal God, 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 light from light, true God, true God, God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became a part of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and died in the mind of Christ. He suffered death and was buried there. On the third day, he rose up again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken of the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We live the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. Make us free to be the church in the world, God of grace. Form our mission and ministry in ways that truly reflect our commitment to Jesus Christ. Be with all bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be one with your creation, God of grace. Fill us with your spirit and lead us to use wisely and well what you have given us. Help us to be good stewards. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be brothers and sisters, God of grace. Help us to overcome distinctions that create fear and suspicion. Open our eyes to see the truth that all people of all nations bear the image of God. Be present with our president and Congress, governor and legislature. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be ministers of mercy to those in need and be with all those who are in sorrow or need, sickness or any other adversity, especially those we now name in our hearts before you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to follow wherever you shall lead us as St. Paul's faith community knowing that all things work for good in those that love and trust you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be people of hope who believe in the resurrection to eternal life, as we remember those who have gone before us with the sign of faith, especially those most dear to us whom we now name in our hearts. May light perpetual shine upon them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O Holy One, we entrust all for whom we pray. Confident in your abundant and abiding mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's socially distance and share that peace.
Do we have any birthdays to celebrate or anniversaries? Uh, you may be seated. Any celebrations? Well, I have one to share. My first friend, my first and only grandson, came home two weeks ago, and my granddaughter came home yesterday from the hospital. So thank you for your thank you for your prayers. Both are doing well and healthy, and mom and dad are both excited and anxious and doing well also. So. I appreciate all of your prayers for me. Um, do we receive the offering? This says receiving the offering, but we don't do that, right? No. Okay. Coming soon. Hmm? Coming soon. Coming soon. <laughs> At this point, we receive the offering on the way out. <laughs> Coming soon to a few years. Yes. Yes. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and his promise to come again, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we implore you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, that we and all who share in the body and blood of your Son may be filled with heavenly peace and joy, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be sanctified in soul and body, and have our portion with all your saints. All honor and glory are yours, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare to come to the Lord's table by offering the Lord's prayer, saying with one heart and one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The living Christ was made known to them in the breaking of the bread.
Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his strength. Amen. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have we received, received from your table more than we ever could ever ask. As you have nourished us, us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own, with your own life. In your, in your name, name we pray. We pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We'll sing hymn number 495, Lead On, O King Eternal. Frau Katharina.